Let me turn to the self, because that's what I'm supposed to be talking about. I would say the self is an illusion. What do I mean by illusion? I don't mean, and, and uh, uh, like Dan Dennis and other people who are interested in illusions, um, <laughs> you get accused of saying it doesn't exist. The Buddha had this trouble, didn't he? To some people he would say, of course the self exists. And to other people he'd say, no, there's no self. I think the point about this is, it's not that there is or isn't a self, it's that the self is not what we think. So, look it up in the dictionary, which is what I did when I started to get into trouble with this concept. Illusion in the dictionary is usually defined as something like, something that is not what it seems to be. Something that we're deluded about its nature. So, I would like to ask you now, just for a moment, to be conscious and see, what is it like to be me now? Right. Does it seem a bit like this? Well, I know that you know that there isn't an armchair in your head that you're sitting in. But I suggest many of you will have, have dropped out of this feeling, but you can probably drop back into it. Most people in the world, I think, do feel something like this. It's very natural. It seems to be the way that we're, we're built. That we feel as, oh, there's my foot. That's my foot, that's my knee, that's my tummy, and I'm in here looking at them when I look this at I'm up here and I'm looking at my foot. And I'm over here and you're out there. That's a kind of natural way that we feel about ourselves. But of course it's rubbish. There is not only no armchair, but there isn't any um, place in the brain. This is what Dan Dennett calls the Cartesian theatre. It's this alluring place that we kind of invent. We may give up Cartesian dualism. We may be absolutely sure that there isn't mind stuff and physical stuff or matter and consciousness. We, we, know, we, we, we say we're monists, but actually we still believe in a kind of experiencing self, the experiencer and the experience. And according to him, and I, I would agree, um, this is just it doesn't fit with what we know about how the brain works at all. So that's why he says that when you discard Cartesian dualism, as almost everybody does, you must really discard the show that would have gone on in the Cartesian theatre and the audience as well. Now, people often throw out the audience, or they think they do, but it kind of creeps back. It's even harder to throw out the show. The feeling that I am having a stream of experiences is so compelling that we keep getting back into it. But it makes no sense at all in terms of what's going on in the brain. When you look at the visual cortex here at the back of your brain, which is a good proportion of your brain, vision is very important in humans, you find there's something like 40 parallel pathways going on there. Some meet up again and separate out, others don't. Different information being, you know, going through the ventral stream and the dorsal stream and doing different jobs. And they never come together into some kind of place where the picture is that you see in the world because you don't actually see a picture in the world. We're kind of compelling this, this feeling that, oh, I can see the whole room, when you actually, I and mean, that's another whole story, <coughs> which I often talk about and written about, but to do with <coughs> change blindness, inattentional blindness, and so on. Um, we can show that there, is no, there isn't that kind of um, a representation. There, there isn't anywhere in the brain where the show happens. There's just shows going on all over the place, lots and lots and lots of parallel shows. And what about the self, who might be experiencing them? Well, there's no middle. <clears throat> you know, it's, the brain is not organized in such a way that stuff comes in and ends up somewhere and then orders go out. Not at all. There's stuff going through here. I mean, the fact that I'm not going to crash into this is all happening very, very fast through the, um, the ventral, through the dorsal stream, straight to motor cortex from eyes, without going through the other part in the ventral stream, which does all the perception and decides, that, oh, it's flowers. Um, that happens more slowly. They don't come together, these things. They're separate. Separate. I know that's kind of weird, but it's important to know that because it helps to kind of throw apart, intellectually, intellectually throw apart the idea that there's me in, inside here doing it. And, and, and give rise, therefore, to understanding a little bit about what it might mean to say that I am an illusion or the self is an illusion. It feels this way, but it really isn't. It feels, I submit, but I'm please argue for many of you, it may not feel this way with an audience like this of people who've generally done a lot of, of uh, uh, meditation, mindfulness, you know, exploration. Oh, here I am. Seems to be me, seems to be one me. One me in charge of this body. Unified, continuous, 
It seems to be, well, it doesn't anymore, actually, but it used to seem to be that it was me a few minutes ago, and before that it was me and the little girl, and so on, that there was something continuous about the me's generated by this brain and this body. It seems to be that there's a me having a stream of experiences, and it seems to be that I have some effect on my body. I can say, I can raise my hand, ha, 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 and I did it. Now, there's plenty of... Uh, Psychological evidence, fascinating stuff. Um, that's just an illusion. We have thoughts. No, really, really. I mean, Libet's work is just the start. Um, we have thoughts They're about an action, say. The action happens. There's a correlation. They're in that order. We jump to the conclusion that one caused the other. But we can tell from what's going on in the brain that it isn't like that at all. Um, indeed, uh, we know so much now about the mechanisms of, of, of self-control, uh, of decision-making, of uh, choices and so on, and where they're happening in frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, and so on, again distributed and so on, that the idea of there being a me who initiates actions is just bonkers, but, but it still feels that way. Okay, the science, I think, is therefore very helpful because it goes on banging, you know, you're not in there. There's just this stuff, you know, doing something, whatever it is, and we don't even know fundamentally what it is. So, I mean, I've said that already. There's nowhere in there where it all comes together. There's just all this massive parallel processing going on, uh, causing this body to, these words to come out, and this body not to crash into the pretty flowers. So, let's take a different tack. Let's say, are you going to come do something to me again? <laughs> uh, <laughs> later. <laughs> Let's say I sit in meditation and look for myself. Or I could do Douglas Harding kind of thing, couldn't I? I look for the person who's looking, and what do I find? I find the world. I can go round and round. <laughs> oh. <laughs> ah! I don't find myself as I thought it was. I don't find a consistent uh, experiencer of the experiences. I find, help, I don't know, instead. I want to tell you a little bit about um, some simple explorations, I want one particular exploration actually, and then I'll kind of wind up with some, with, with explaining why I called the talk what I did call it. Um, years ago, I used to teach a consciousness course in Bristol. I did it for about 10 years, and it, it resulted in the textbook that I wrote about consciousness. And I don't know how I got into it, but it happened very early on, probably in the first year, that I started to get the students to ask a question. Every week, they had to ask it hundreds of times, as many times as they could every day. It's amazingly difficult to get them to do it. And they'd all come and say, oh, I forgot. And then they put stickers on the kettle and stickers on the door and prod each other in pairs to make them remember and all kinds of tricks. Still hard. I don't know why it's so hard it is. By the way, are you conscious now? Well? <laughs> oh, of course. I love the ones who say, of course, such confidence. Um, <laughs> I also like the ones shaking their heads. I don't like the people who don't say anything. Are you conscious now? <laughs> Great, we love a lovely mixture of yes, no, and boo. Um, <laughs> now, there's a very, very interesting thing about this question. This is question number one in week number one of this 20-week course. Um, are you conscious now? You've just walked in. Are you conscious now? Doesn't know. Um, the, the odd thing about this question is, I know there were some of you saying no, and there are various interesting reasons why you might be saying no. But, but normally, basically, if you ask, am I conscious now, the answer is always yes. Did any of you get the odd sensation when I asked you, are you conscious now, of sort of, ooh, kind of become, yeah? It's like, oh, you're becoming conscious because I've asked you. Yeah? Something like that. Now, this can be very puzzling, because you think to yourself, well, of course I was conscious before, but, but then something happened that was different. What changed? It felt like I was becoming conscious, but does that mean I wasn't conscious before? 
And it's a very odd thing. Not all of you will have had it, but perhaps if I tap you on the back later on and you're not being very mindful, you'll go... <laughs> Well, was I conscious before? So this uh, took me to my next question. This, by the way, um, I, I, I wrote a book about this, which was originally called Ten Zen Questions, and then, um, and then they decided to bring the paper back out and change the title, which is really irritating. So don't go and buy both books, because they're the same. Um, and, it, and it really annoys me. Uh, but it's a much more trendy title, isn't it? Zen and the Art of Consciousness. Anyway, that... That, that peculiar thing that you experienced and a few other people did led me to the second question. What was I conscious of a moment ago? I would like you would all to ask yourself that question now. What was I conscious of a moment ago? <laughs> now, I don't know if this works for any of you. It took me a long time for this to stabilize. And I mean a long time. When I was writing this book, some of the chapters are based on koan retreats, you know, um, with other people, in, you know, organized koan retreats. Uh, most of them are, are based on the solitary retreats, which I did on my own, either up in the Welsh mountains or at home. And I would ask the same question hour after hour, day after day, based in uh, a simple uh, Zen meditation. Zazen. Calm the mind for quite a while and just let the question come when it comes. What was I conscious of a moment ago? Okay, I've just done it now. Now, the obvious thought would be I was conscious of the words coming out of my mouth because surely I must have been thinking about them because giving a lecture, you know, it's quite, you need a bit of attention. But I can hear that humming noise over there as though somebody's been listening. And hang on, I was sort of faintly aware of a man nodding over there. I'd forgotten, I wouldn't have, you know, if I hadn't asked myself the question, I would have, that would have gone. But it sort of feels as though, well, there was somebody listening to that noise over there, but it wasn't me because I was concentrating on what I was saying. When I was doing this out in the, in the, the wilds of the mountains, I would get this sense, or no, it was more interesting when I was doing it at home, I have a meditation hut in the garden, and... Um, because I was, what are you conscious of? What was I conscious of a moment ago? And multiple parallel threads would be obvious. I hadn't even noticed because I'm just sitting. There's a great drilling going on in the road. <laughs> but when I asked that question, it's as though somebody was listening to the drilling. Who was it? Somebody. Oh, somebody was aware of the my bottom sitting on the cushion. And the cat, the cat's been purring for ages. In fact, I kind of remember the cat turning up and curling up next to me. All of these things when I look backwards. So what's going on? Now, this is where, that's the experience, okay? But I'm now jumping to a, an intellectual interpretation of the experience that might be wrong. It's always dangerous to do that. But my interpretation, I tried inventing this little um, graphic this morning, which doesn't quite do it justice. But what I'm thinking is something like this. Most of the time, most of our lives, most of the time, what's happening is what you'd expect in a complex brain, in a complex body, in a complex world. There's multiple parallel streams going along, and none of them is in consciousness or out of consciousness. None of them is what I am experiencing or I'm not experiencing. They're all just going along, some bigger than others, and that's what these lines are. Some are ephemeral, very short-lived, some are rather longer, some maybe there are selves. Maybe this one, there's a kind of a bit of a self-construct going along, and we know where these self-constructs are made in the, um, in the uh, uh, temporoparietal junction is the, the body image made, and so on. So, on. so we can, you know, can track those things if we wanted to. Um, but what I'm suggesting is there might even be two in parallel. There might be several in parallel. The coming and going, shifting. You know. But then, da-da, you ask the question, am I conscious now? Or any question you like that, that propels you into mindfulness. Um, and then what happens? All the rest kind of blah, blah, blah. And they're all brought together. And you go, oh, here I am. And that's fine, but you make the mistake, this is where the delusion comes about, of going, and I was conscious before, and I've been conscious all day. Somebody mentioned that in a lecture this morning, just with utter confidence. Oh, well, I've been conscious all the time. I, I submit that you haven't. And every time this happens, which will be many, many times a day if you're practicing something like mindfulness and falling out of mindfulness, um, then if you're mindful all the time, then you're staying like this, then... Um, if you keep popping back into it, you think it's the same self, or at least that's the delusionary way of thinking about it. 
Mindfulness is very interesting because I suspect that in the beginning what happens in mindfulness is that you bring up this self, I am being mindful. And that's that transition there. And you can keep the self for a long time with practice of mindfulness. But I think what happens later on in mindfulness practice is that the self drops out. And, we, and possibly awareness can remain of this parallel state in which there isn't a self and then one is seeing clearly only there isn't a self to see clearly rather there is um, just experiences without an experiencer but that's really um, uh, another issue so what happened in the last half an hour or so there was a me because I could be got quite nervous because there was a problem with wires I'm thinking, mm, there's a me and full away and there's another one and then there's another one and then there's a whole distracted gap with a whole lot of things going, oh, and here I am again. Ah! But I'm not, this thing here is not conned into thinking it's the same me. Partly because of the science and partly because of the personal inquiry, I say that wasn't the same me. And looking forward into the future, it won't be the same me either. In a few minutes, I'll be... Oh, no, in a few minutes I'll be answering your questions, I hope. And should a me pop up and a sensation of I'm over here and you're over there and I'm going to answer the questions, that will be a new me. She won't be me, this one. How do we live with this? If it's true, it may not be. I really like, I mean, this is my kind of scientist nature coming out. You know, have an idea, have a hypothesis, we'll go and test it. Right, okay. I'll go and live my life like this and see how, how it works out and what happens. And if I'm wrong, someone can prove me wrong and I'll change my mind, do something else. Um, equally daft, maybe. Um, but how do we live with this? One little trick I've discovered, and I would love to hear from other people if any of you have been doing anything similar, is this. It is... Um, I'm, I'm going to just uh, discuss three things about it. It's learning to let go of her. And this is very tricky because while I, as long as I feel that this is me, I want to carry on. And this is another interesting intellectual question. Why? Why do selves want to carry on? Why are they so greedy to, to exist and where they are? So a practice that I've been doing is whenever there's a feeling of, here I am, am I conscious now? Yes, here I am. Um, I think, uh, and willing, to not be. And in a way, it's only like going to sleep at night, isn't it? I mean, you know, you lie down, you think, I'm going to stop existing until the morning. And you sort of, that's kind of why going to sleep is such a weird thing. But it's sort of the same, going to sleep while awake, or disappearing, dying, if you like. Just, ah, she's allowed to go. And uh, importantly, and similar to in meditation, the dealing with thoughts, it's not go away. It's not, oh, here I am, go away. No, no, oh, here I am, oh. I'll go away at some point, letting her go away. That, that's, I, I think, quite helpful. It's also part of this kind of comparison between before and after the, the question, the unified, mindful state of being me experiencing stuff and the kind of nor normal, everyday, parallel processing, distracted state. Looking back into that, um, it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from William James, who, who is my great, great hero. He tried a lot of introspection, and he said introspection of this kind is like trying to turn up the gas quickly enough to see how the darkness looks. Of course, he'd have electricity now. It would be, it would be um, much quicker, wouldn't it? <laughs> and you can't look into the darkness by shining the light. Was that any time left or stop now? Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so this is an attempt, if you like, to look into the darkness, but I can't look into the darkness. But by letting myself go, as it were, her, whoever she is, this one who appears, then maybe the darkness can, can become light. So that's one little trick. But one might reasonably have a question about, I called it morality, but I'm not sure I, I couldn't think of a better word, but if she won't be me, then um, why should I care? I mean, if it's not going to be me in the future who's going to suffer the pain or the joy or the whatever it is, then, then why should I care about what happens? Why should I do anything? Why should I act? Now, I think many of you would say, well, you don't, actually. And, and I agree, one doesn't. It's not me who acts. 
neither scientifically nor experientially. Actions happen. Or, to quote um, uh, another Buddhist thing, um, actions exist and also their consequences, but the person that acts does not. But then why should I care? Well, I think the reason, I, I, you know, I'm quite concerned about this really, because why do I care about her this afternoon if she's not me? Well, she's kind of similar to me, and we'll have similar memories and similar tendencies to behave, because after all, she's going to be constructed, an illusion constructed by this body. Um, maybe that's a reason. But I think actually more generally, it's only the same as, you know, in general, I see suffering all around in the world, and kind of I'd rather people didn't suffer. Um, and the same for, um, for, for, for these selves that in the future. And this thing here has some capacity to determine at least deep the, the, the pleasures and, 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 and sufferings of the similar selves that will come in the future more than I can do anything for the rest of you. So maybe that's enough. But also I feel a kind of gratitude towards previous selves that put me here. <laughs> I had a lovely time last night. I went out after dinner in the, in the woods and it was nearly dark. It was a bit silly of me because coming back through the woods in the nearly dark was poking my eyes with stick, you know, trees and what have you. But it was wonderful out there. I was marching round and round the trees thinking what I'm going to say today. And I think a sort of mutual gratitude between the prior, the previous and the future selves is also kind of encouraging to, um, to you know, nice behavior rather than nasty behavior. And what about death? Well... All I've been describing is allowing oneself to die again and again all the time. So, in that sense, it's only the same, isn't it? When the body finally goes, well, all of these rather similar selves will stop. But hey, they were all stopping anyway. They were all being let go. And this kind of this bugbear about um, reincarnation, <sighs> like like so many Western scientists interested in in Buddhism and and, and related ideas, it, 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 reincarnation just seems stupid. What on earth is going to be reincarnated? What's it all about? I, I get in trouble. I had I've had an email thing on one of my blogs um, with with a, a Buddhist teacher, you know, getting really angry with me. And I say I'm not a Buddhist, and I I can say what I like actually, um, and so can you. Um, and that's fine. But why I why I think it's daft is because that, that what I've described as selves can't be reincarnated. There's nothing personal. So what is all this stuff about the cycle of birth and death? or rebirth, what's that about then? Is it about anything? Well, here's a very different interpretation. Yes, it is. It's actually a, a, a very straightforward insight into what it is to be alive. It's constantly dying and re being born again. Selves are rising and falling away. And so long as you believe that it's the same self and it's continuous and unitary and has powers and does things and is in charge of its body and all of that, you're still stuck in all of that delusion. But if you just go, Oh, here it comes, here it goes. You're not. Could that be something about what getting off the rebirth thing is about? I don't know. I throw that in as a pure speculation. Um, but let me go back to, to where I was. These selves just pop up. Oh, here's another one. And uh, she'll be about to say goodbye. And I hope that makes sense of why I called it. She won't be me. <laughs>